Okay, welcome everyone uh, for today's seminar. Uh, we have the pleasure to have Janet Hung from Fudan University, who is going to tell us about emergent Einstein equations and piatic tensor network. Janet, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you all the organizers for giving me an opportunity to give this talk. Uh, so I think this is the third time I'm giving a talk uh, in MPI about the Piatic uh, Tensor Network. So, uh, so every time there is a little bit of uh, uh, progress and uh, uh, and but but then all of these started back in 2018 and 19, uh, and we had uh, a, a couple papers with uh, Wei and Charles uh, on building a tensor network that describes the piatic uh, CFT. Uh, so uh, so uh, so 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 this work that we did uh, that we put out uh, a few papers uh, with our postdoc Lin and my uh, Xirong uh, earlier this year is uh, basically. Uh, some ex uh, some developments that were based on these uh, earlier works with uh, Wei uh, and and Charles uh, in the last uh, couple of uh, couple of years. So um, so so what we're going to show is that uh, the piatic tensor network that we built before uh, secretly encodes an Einstein equation uh, in a very precise uh, sense uh, that we're uh, uh, that that we're going to show uh, uh, really perturbatively. Uh, uh, because non-perturbative seems uh, a bit harder, but uh, and so we worked perturbatively, uh, but uh, we, we were able to build some uh, uh, Einstein equation. Uh, I shouldn't say build. We read off uh, some Einstein equation in some precise way uh, that is encoded uh, in the tensor network. So, uh, uh, so I, I will start with uh, a very brief introduction uh, of what this program is about what does it mean by reading off an Einstein equation uh, and then uh, I would uh, move on to a very short uh, a very light lightning review of the piatic uh, tensor network that we developed with Wei and Charles uh, and and then we'll go on to discuss how to uh, so, so we were discussing something like a pure ADS space when we built that tensor network, and so uh, in this talk, I would first talk about how to bend uh, the, that uh, BT tree to curve the uh, ADS-like space-time in the tensor network, and as soon as we started bending it, uh, then we have to worry about how to define distances on this tensor network uh, and and how to read off an Einstein equation. Uh, uh, so, so that would be the second part of this talk. Uh, and, and then I would give a summary and outlook uh, of all this stuff. So, uh, so let me start with uh, 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 motivating uh, what we're doing. So uh, uh, all of us are interested uh, in ultimately building uh, a theory of quantum gravity. And what does uh, quantum gravity amounts to? I guess uh, uh, when we talk about the word quantum, we're talking about uh, the algebra. Uh, we, we were talking about uh, finding an algebra. And gravity is probably about a geometry. Uh, so ultimately, when we talk about quantum gravity, it is to read off some geometrical data, some geometry stuff from some algebra. Uh, of course, that is a very difficult task. Uh, normally, we obtain uh, an algebra from uh, canonical quantization, uh, and uh, and clearly that doesn't work here. So the ADS-CFT correspondence give us some hope that uh, the algebra appropriate for gravity is not some totally foreign things. Uh, somehow uh, this uh, algebra suitable for uh, uh, gravity uh, is encoded in some conformal field theory. Uh, but of course, uh, the problem is by no means simplified uh, by uh, uh, knowing that there is an equivalence because uh, to understand the uh, algebra uh, in, in the ADS space, uh, there is some highly non-trivial encoding uh, that you have to, uh, that uh, ADS operators, uh, operators, uh, gravitational operators are encoded in some very mysterious way in terms of CFT operators. And so, uh, so, so by knowing that there's an equivalence between ADS and CFT doesn't uh, immediately tell us how to formulate the problem of uh, quantum gravity. So uh, this uh, root Takanagi formula gives us a lot of insights uh, in, in this problem uh, because it says the entanglement entropy of the CFT, which is some algebraic data, is related 
to the uh, it's related to some geometrical data of the uh, dual gravi uh, gravitational theory. Uh, it says that uh, the minimal area of a minimal surface uh, divided by four times the Newton's constant is related to the entanglement entropy of uh, uh, of the CFT. And so that was the uh, that was what uh, led to. Uh, this proposal that perhaps the tensor network is somehow capturing the microscopic workings of the ADS-CFT correspondence. So uh, this is the, an observation made by Brian Swingle, uh, I think back in 2012. And uh, as a condensed matter person, he was working with uh, these uh, tensor network ansatz that builds up uh, wave functions of uh, many body uh, 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 wave functions, build up ground states of many body wave functions. And uh, one central theme about the tensor network is that uh, we break down a wave function into these uh, products of many different uh, tensors uh, where uh, every uh, and these tensors are represented by the vertices in this picture and uh, the each index is represented by a leg and uh, when we have two tensors contracted with each other then they are connected by a link uh, and so uh, a, a, a wave function with a certain physical indices that are represented here by these uh, lengths that are dangling can be broken down into uh, a product of many tensors. And how do we choose uh, uh, what the graph is like and uh, what, how do we choose uh, the values of these tensors? The idea is that the choice of this graph and a general choice of the bond dimension is, uh, is, is inspired, is should be inspired by the entanglement structure of the underlying wave function. Uh, and, uh, and, and in particular, by writing down a certain ansatz that represent uh, the uh, uh, corresponding wave function, we are turning this uh, uh, algebraic data about the entanglement uh, of this uh, wave function into geometric data. We're turning, uh, uh, so, so the uh, graph, the connectivity of this graph is directly encoding the entanglement or uh, the entanglement structure of the corresponding wave function. And in this sense, uh, it therefore looks very, very similar to the Rutekinaki formula, where uh, the entanglement entropy is ca uh, encapsulated by the geometric data of the uh, of the gravity theory. And in in the case of these tensor networks, the graph uh, connections, uh, the geometrical data of this graph is capturing the entanglement structure of the corresponding wave function. And so there's a possibility. Uh, so uh, it is proposed that perhaps the tensor network is uh, capturing the, how the ADS-CFT works, is capturing some essential features of the ADS-CFT uh, correspondence. Uh, but of course, uh, in order to check uh, this uh, proposal, uh, it is necessary to build up some um, uh, micro uh, some some models uh, if they're t t if only toy models to illustrate how the ADS-CFT would emerge when we try to write down a tensor network that uh, that corresponds to uh, that describes some CFT ground states, let's say. Uh, and so, uh, when, so so what what exactly is the program that we're for? Uh, so so. So what exactly is the program that we want to pursue ultimately to say that we have successfully recovered the ADS-CFT correspondence? Uh, the steps that we have to take is that, first of all, we have to ask uh, if we're doing it in a uh, discretized version that we have to ask, what kind of graph uh, do, I, uh, uh, do I pick uh, on which I cover uh, t some tensors? Uh, once I've chosen that graph, then I have to decide what kind of tensors do I put on each vertex. Uh, and uh, supposedly, I want to recover either the wave function or the partition function of the CFT. But uh, no, even knowing that, uh, in general, it's pretty hard to decide what exactly are the uh, precise values that I should put uh, on, on this uh, network. So assuming that I have decided upon what the graph is and what the tensors are, then I have to uh, determine uh, uh, a way to read off any meta content that is encoded by, by this tensor network. So of course this tensor network is supposedly encoding some CFT uh, wave function or partition function, but uh, in order that ADS-CFT emerges, I would have to 
check if some kind of meta field is secretly uh, uh, described by the tensor network that is uh, running uh, that is effectively uh, running around uh, this uh, discrete space. If I sorry, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so I have a question uh, regarding uh, the tensor network picture. So in tensor networks, uh, yeah, like it's, it's it's not. I mean, it's a graphical way of representing, uh, you know, states or uh, time evolution in in quantum many body systems or you know other operators. Um, right. But like an important ingredient there is uh, that these tensor networks are reasonably easy to work with. Uh, that is, you know, contractions uh, cost not too much, uh, and you're able to find uh, a ground state of the system that you're interested in, right? Or you're able to compute reduced density matrix, like for uh, for Mera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the question is, like, for 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 this endeavor that 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 you're up to, like, would this matter, or like this is not really part of 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 the picture? Uh, so these, what what matter? Networks are, I, I... Well, like, what, what I'm asking is like if if it's important that you're able to do with a tensor network efficient computation. Uh, 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 there's it's a little bit blurred on my end, oh. so I couldn't hear the final uh, uh, some Sorry, parts uh, of the. My my question is like, does it matter that you can uh, you know manipulate the the tensor network and contract it uh, you know in efficiently? To produce results, or what's important for you is that uh, you can reproduce, you can represent your state as some graph, and like if you can really evaluate yeah. this graph on a computer, it's it's irrelevant. I okay, I see. Uh, this is a great question. So uh, ideal. Uh, so the problem is, in general, if I'm not able to compute this on a very big graph. Uh, or maybe a continuous version, then it's very hard to make very precise statements. And so, uh, so, but I guess uh, as far as reproducing ADS-CFT is concerned, uh, supposedly whether I'm able to compute this thing efficiently is probably not supposed to be uh, uh, a determining factor whether I'm getting the right graph and the right tensors but practically if I'm not capable of evaluating uh, this network then it's also very hard to judge whether I have success or whether uh, I, I have uh, it is failure uh, in fact I would talk about uh, if time allows, I would describe a few things that we're currently doing uh, that deals with more realistic CFT. Uh, and in that case, then uh, we, we're basically capable of only doing things numerically. But as soon as we uh, dive into this numerics um, world, then things are really complicated. It's way harder to decide if we have success or failure. So in this regard, our piatic ADSFT is really um, quite special that it is possible at all to do something precise. But but uh, yeah, that, that, that is both uh, a blessing and a curse. Being too simple uh, is a problem, but uh, it was simple enough to do anything concrete. Uh, Thank you. Uh, right. Okay. So, uh, so, so uh, I, I was uh, mentioning that uh, uh, once we have chosen what the tensors are, then we have to, in general, it is describing some complicated geometry. So we have to ask ourselves how to uh, put in, uh, how to determine the distances between two points. So uh, as we're going to see, uh, or, or as we have seen in the literature, like Tadashi, he has uh, worked on some similar. Uh, uh, example toy models uh, with C mirror, and he made many guesses of the uh, way to define distances, uh, such as uh, defining some Fisher information metric and so on. So, so, so we even we, we have to take this step uh, at some point and make a guess of what distances mean. Uh, and so once we have decided what the distances are, we have uh, tried to read off what is the matter content that is running in this uh, discrete space that then we have uh, to uh, compute uh, some kind of Einstein tensor uh, based on this distance assignment on this graph. And supposedly we should also be able, because we are able to read off matter content uh, on this graph, uh, supposedly there's some kind of stress tensor in the bulk 
uh, as opposed to stress tensor in the boundary. This is stress tensor in the bulk describing uh, bulk metal. Uh, so so uh, assuming we are also able to read off this stress tensor, then we can make a comparison between uh, this uh, uh, curvature uh, and stress tensor. And if uh, there's an emergent Einstein equation, then it means that this Einstein, uh, this, uh, Einstein tensor is somehow equal or proportional to uh, the stress tensor in the bulk. And so this really underlies why it is so incredibly difficult to do anything concrete, uh, as we have seen in many previous trials, because we have made too many guesses in the process, from the graph, the tensors, to uh, assignment of distance, uh, assignment of curvature, and then assignment of uh, matter content, and then finally making comparison between these two things. And when we make so many guesses, then chances are that uh, nothing is going to match with nothing. Uh, and, and so this is one of the reasons why it took us so long uh, to, uh, to find a way to do these things systematically so that it remains uh, uh, quantitative, uh, at least in this simple scenario of the Piatic CFT. Okay, so uh, let's go to uh, this Piatic uh, tensor network. Uh, and uh, so uh, I have given this talk multiple times, but in case it is not already familiar to everyone, so let me give a very, very quick um, review of what the Piatic uh, ADS CFT is. So first of all, what is the Piatic uh, CFT? Uh, the Piatic CFT is really uh, sort of uh, something, uh, some analog of uh, uh, a CFT. And uh, the only difference is that instead of uh, the space-time coordinates in a real CFT, uh, real numbers, uh, in a Piatic CFT, you replace this uh, uh, coordinate uh, to live in the Piatic field rather than the real field. So the Piatic field is a different uh, field completion of the rational. So all rational numbers are real numbers, but they're also automatically these Piatic numbers. Uh, this P is uh, some prime number. Uh, and every such piatic number can be expressed as a, 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 such a power series. Um, and you can think of this power series as expressing every number uh, as in base P. Uh, and so these AMs, they take value from 0 to P minus 1. So it is as if I'm expressing a number in base P. Uh, and uh, you can take the leading term, and the leading term would determine the uh, norm of a piatic number. So if uh, x is equals to p to the v times uh, this uh, infinite power series, then the norm of x is basically p to the minus v. And this de definition of the norm is uh, interesting because it satisfies all the uh, basic axioms uh, that distance should uh, satisfy. Uh, and so that is one reason why uh, people considered uh, this uh, Piatic fields uh, as an interesting uh, field completion of, uh, of the rational numbers. Uh, so uh, we're not really going to make use of any of these things uh, in the rest of the talk. So uh, so this is not important. Uh, so what? Uh, so for simplicity, uh, let's consider one-dimensional CFT. Uh, what I'm going to say actually applies for arbitrary dimension, but just to make things simple, uh, I, I'll talk about uh, the one-dimensional case first. So in one-dimensional CFT, uh, how does conformal transmission works? Uh, it's basically given by uh, taking x to ax plus b over cx plus d, and uh, a, b, c, d form a, a group, or the SL2R group. Uh, in the case of this piatic CFT, uh, things work in exactly the same way, x goes to ax plus b over cx plus d, but now a, b, c, d belong belongs to, uh, they, they are now QP um, uh, numbers, and so uh, they form the uh, PGL to QP group. Uh, so I'm just, uh, so, so PGL to QP because we're leaving the determinant to be arbitrary uh, rather than uh, setting it to one. But uh, this is uh, just a detail that is not uh, that, that, that is not so important. So, so you can think of uh, the piatic uh, conformal transformation as basically the direct analog of uh, the Mobius transformation for real CFT. So what is the basic algebraic data that defines a piatic CFT? Uh, it's almost the same as a real CFT. You need to tell us what is the spectrum of uh, the theory, what are the primary operators. And primary operators transforms in an analogous way to uh, uh, operators uh, in real CFTs. So under a conformal transformation, you pick up this factor, uh, that, uh, and this factor has a power that is controlled by the conformal dimension of 
test or the uh, uh, primary operator. And the second set of data that you need are OP coefficients. You take two operators to be close to each other and there's an OP expansion. And, uh, and the OP expansion, as you can see, looks almost completely analogous to uh, real CFTs. Uh, uh, and this CIJ case, they are the OP coefficients, uh, uh, except we're replacing uh, the real norms by uh, p-adic norms. Uh, note also that there are no descendants uh, uh, and, and reason is that uh, if you look at uh, the definition of p-adic norms, then you can see that um, uh, I can change the digits for uh, uh, larger uh, powers of p. And uh, if I change those, those digits, it totally does not affect uh, the, the norms. So it means that when you take two points that are very close together, uh, 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 changing the digits means making infinitesimal cha changes. Uh, changing the digits of very high power p, uh, the norms of very high power p is very small because it is one over. Uh, and this is why this series is convergent from the point of view of the p-adic norm. Uh, but you, you can see that if I change the digits of very, very high power, uh, 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 of very high powers in P, uh, it doesn't change the norms. So it means that uh, when I make infinitesimal changes to uh, X, uh, uh, the distances are exactly invariant. And, and, and so it means that when I try to take derivatives of this guy, uh, it is as if there's no, uh, I'm not able to define derivatives in this uh, usual sense. And therefore, uh, it would appear that OP expansion, there's no contributions of descendants. Uh, so that is one reason why uh, the piatic CFT looks so simple. But that aside, when I sh uh, we can compute a two-point co correlation functions and three-point correlation functions in analogous way to uh, real CFT, and you're going to find that uh, two-point functions just from conformal in uh, invariance uh, takes uh, this form. Uh, where it is exactly the same as real CFT, except you replace the real norm by p norm. And three-point functions uh, looks like that, which is, again, completely analogous. And you can then now move on to four-point, five-point, and so on, as long as you have the um, uh, OP coefficients and the conformal dimension. You can basically build up all the rest of the correlations from this basic data. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, yes. Um, yes, yes. So I, I got confused about the fact that there are basically no derivatives sort of because, for instance, translation operator, which should be in the conformal group, uh, in, yes. the, in the normal case, it acts as, as a derivative, right? And so here That's you're right. saying that it, it doesn't really appear. So how do I have to think about that? Uh, so what happens is that let's say I am computing a two-point function x minus y, right? Uh, and then uh, so I get this stuff. So normally when you say uh, when we say we want to compute two-point function of the primary with a descendant, I take derivative with respect to y, right? Uh, but then if I make an infinitesimal translation in y, uh, this norm is not going to change, and so it would appear that if I take derivative, if I take y to y plus epsilon. Uh, I would still get uh, 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 the derivative would appear to be identically zero. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean that the representations of the PGL2QP group is finite dimension. It just means that I'm not able to talk about, I'm not able to talk about this representation. Uh, I'm not able to define things like Lie algebra um, in the same way that I would define it uh, in, in the real case. It doesn't mean that the representations are finite dimensional, but, uh, but you can see that uh, if I do uh, infinitesimal translation in Y, uh, 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 this uh, correlation function doesn't change at all. Okay, so, 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 you're so, saying, the, so you're saying we're still having a Virazoro algebra, but it's simply not represented in the standard way. Uh, uh, very good. Uh, whether there is a Virasoro algebra uh, is, uh, I think, people try to find ways of defining it, uh, but it's definitely not. Uh, so, so, right. Uh, so, so whether uh, I, 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 I shouldn't say that there is a Virasoro algebra because uh, this is not yet uh, a resolved 
uh, issue, whether that I can define some kind of verse or algebra. All I can say is that uh, what what I can say safely is that um, the representations of um, the conformal group uh, or, or the the piadic conformal group is still infinite dimension. All the non-trivial representations, except that you just you just can't see it by taking you just can't see them by doing infinitesimal uh, transformation. But when you do an um, a, a large uh, transformation, then you are going to need all of them, and you can still build representations based on functions on x. So it that you you still need an infinite dimension, uh, infinite number of bases. Uh, but but uh, but 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 uh, they are not related to each other by simple. You, you can't generate the the, the all the. Uh, uh, you can't generate uh, the entire uh, representation from infinitesimal transformation. That is so. Uh, that that okay, that thanks. is wrong. Okay, right. Um, but 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 it would uh, look very simple uh, locally. Okay, so what about a piadic uh, ADS-CFT? So, uh, so it was proposed by Gupser, uh, independently by Gupser and company, and also Hedeman and company back in the end of 2016, uh, the beginning of 2017. So the idea was that they wanted to build, uh, they wanted to ask the question whether this simplified version of a CFT has also a geometrical dual. And so they uh, made the following observation. In the real case, uh, the isometry group of CFT, uh, the, the, the conformal group is uh, uh, SL2R, and that should be chosen as the isometry group of this dual geometry. Uh, so, but, but then the uh, isotopy group or maximal compact subgroup of the, um, of the conformal group is SL2R. So ADS space, ADS2 in this case, can be thought of as the quotient of the conformal group by its isotopy group. Uh, so, so that gives you the upper half plane. So they take the same formula to uh, construct geometrical dual of the, uh, of the piadic CFT. So they take the conformal group uh, that is going to play the role of the isometry group of the geometry. Then they look for the isotopy group of, the, uh, uh, of this conformal group, and then they take quotient. Uh, and that is, uh, they propose that this guy is the geometrical dual of the piadic CFT. And this guy, it happens that unlike the ADS space, this guy is discrete. Uh, the reason being that the isotopy group is very big. Uh, and so once you take the quotient, uh, uh, even though QP itself is Uh, these two things, uh, it, uh, it becomes something that is discrete. Uh, and this uh, discrete uh, uh, geometry is called the Brut-Hart strip. Uh, so what they, so, so, so then they did is that uh, they computed, uh, uh, they defined some field theory on this uh, discrete space, and then computed Witten diagrams on this discrete space and show that, oh, uh, this is uh, uh, Witten diagrams reproduce uh, correlation functions of the CFT. So it works exactly like the usual version of ADS space, except uh, 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 as ADS CFT, except uh, the um, uh, the bulk geometry is now discrete. So this bulk geometry uh, 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 looks very much like a discrete version of ADS space. It has a radial direction and an asymptotic boundary. The asymptotic boundary is the QP line. Uh, so in the case of the upper half plane, the asymptotic boundary is the real line. And in this case, the asymptotic boundary is the QP line. And, and uh, the, there's a radial direction uh, uh, that, uh, that is uh, presented as the vertical direction here. For every given choice of uh, the prime number P that determines the piatic field, field the, this BT tree is P plus one valent. So in the case where P equals two, let's say, then uh, every vertex would have three legs. So this tree here, that is uh, the tree that is presented here, is, uh, the, uh, uh, is the dual geometry for Q2, where we've chosen uh, the prime number prime number to be two. Uh, so uh, in the rest of this talk, I will uh, talk mostly about P equals two, but the, the results generalize very easily to uh, arbitrary P. It, it's just a simpler, simpler to draw pictures for P equals two. So now uh, we know that uh, the dual geometry of piatic CFT is discrete. Then it's very, very tempting that we put a tensor network. The graph that is chosen for our tensor network is uh, very tempting to be this 
uh, particular tree. We would break no conformal uh, uh, symmetries by putting a tensor network on this tree. Unlike in the case of uh, ADS-CFT, if I try to discretize ADS space and put a tensor network there, then I essentially breaks lots of symmetry. And uh, by breaking symmetries, then it makes lots of computations very difficult. Uh, 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 and, and so uh, that that is one reason why uh, quantitative uh, stuff is very is very complicated uh, when we try to work with the usual version of ADS-CFT. But here, since the bulk is already discretized, I lose nothing by putting a tensor network there. So so that is the tensor network, uh, the graph that we have chosen. Now, secondly, uh, in this uh, 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 in this CFT, uh, this is a so, sort of a it only has a, an algebraic. Uh, uh, definition of the uh, uh, the algebraic data defines a Euclidean theory basically uh, as you can see the piadic uh, field um, behaves very differently from uh, the real from real numbers and therefore it's not possible uh, or at least I don't know how to talk about Lorenzian version of the theory so this theory you could think of it uh, as, at, at least as far as I understood it or uh, as it was defined by Meltzer initially this uh, algebraic definition of the CFT you could think of it as defining a Euclidean version of the theory so therefore uh, this tensor network it wouldn't make too much sense for us to recover a wave function uh, of the CFT because I don't know how to define real time and time slice and therefore uh, our goal would be to recover the partition function of the CFT directly the generating functions that generates all the correlation functions rather than uh, working with a particular uh, wave function okay so so that is our goal to uh, find a tensor network that recovered the partition function of the CFT uh, so then let's choose some tensors on this uh, tensor network that covers this graph uh, so uh, the, the, the choice of these tensors uh, there, there isn't really that much choice uh, we have some data from the CFT their OP coefficients and conformal dimensions and therefore when we stare at this tree uh, we made a guess uh, that perhaps, uh, so particularly if you work with p equals 2, uh, so every uh, tensor here has three legs, so what is the CFD data that could fit on this, uh, on this vertex? It seems like the OP coefficients is the most natural thing that I could put there, so we made this guess. But uh, if you just put in OP coefficients, it wouldn't recover all the correlation functions. And so we have to put, uh, we, we, uh, by trial and error, we put in a weight on uh, every leg. So when we contract two tensors, uh, every leg is weighted by P to the minus delta. When we sum over the, te uh, the, the uh, labels, which are parameterized by all the primaries of this uh, CFT, uh, we have to weight every label by P to the minus delta, where delta is the conformal dimension of this corresponding uh, primary. And so now, how do I obtain the generating function when there's no operator insertion? Uh, this tensor network uh, goes off to the uh, asymptotic boundary. So like in the usual ADS-CFT, I would have to put in a cutoff somewhere. And, uh, uh, and so there would be lots of dangling legs on the cutoff surface. And so if there's no operator insertion, let's put in zeros. Uh, I, the identity operator that every CFT possess, uh, let's put in uh, identity on every of these boundary legs. Uh, and so uh, if I put in an uh, identity operator, you could see that uh, identity and identity fuse to identity. And so, uh, so basically, uh, every single leg would be projected to identity if I put the boundary legs to be identity. And so it would be equals to 1. It would be a normalized partition function that is normalized to 1. Now, suppose I will have operator insertion, then I would pick a particular uh, boundary point where I'm inserting the operator, and I would uh, uh, replace this projection uh, to the operator label that I'm, I, I want to insert. Uh, so let's say I uh, replace this point and that point to O1 and O2 respectively, uh, whereas the rest of the legs, I'm keeping them to be the identity uh, label. Uh, what would happen then? Uh, then you can see that uh, uh, O1 would fuse with identity to be O1 again. Uh, it would continue, so I would pick up a, a line of O1 until uh, it um, it fuses with this line of O2 back to identity. So uh, I, I could always uh, uh, choose basis such that uh, O1, O2 uh, 
can only fuse to the identity if O1 is the same thing as O2. Uh, then uh, I would be basically picking up a, a, a geodesic that connects these two boundary points ev with every leg weighted by P to the minus delta 1. Uh, and so uh, the nice thing, so, so uh, so basically, I will be, when I compute two-point functions, I will be picking up this kind of uh, functions, p to the minus delta d, where d is the distance of this uh, uh, geodesic. And uh, first of all, this guy here, uh, it is probably not surprising, this geodesic distance is indeed proportional to x1, x1 minus x2 to the minus 2 delta. That is also true in the case of ADS space. And so uh, this computation automatically does give me, uh, up to normalization, there's some subtlety there, but uh, uh, without worrying about those subtleties for now, uh, that this geodesic distance would give us a function that is proportional to x1 minus x2 uh, norm to the power 2 delta, uh, like in the case of ADS space. And secondly, this function that we have picked up is a Green's function of a graph uh, Klein Gordon equation, where the mass of this uh, uh, scalar uh, equation, uh, scalar Klein Gordon equation, is related to the conformal dimension by this expression. Uh, and uh, this is the analog of the relation between mass and conformal dimension in piatic uh, ADS CFT that is already known, uh, that was already discovered by uh, Goops and, and friends. And so, uh, what is uh, nice uh, about our tensor network is that by guessing what is the tensors that we put on every uh, vertex, uh, when we compute uh, co correlation functions uh, uh, of this piatic CFT, the, first of all, we recovered the correlation functions, and secondly, the answer of this correlation function tells us that tells us that there is indeed some kind of scalar matter that is running in this um, uh, in, in this discrete graph. Uh, we were able to by computing correlation functions of the boundary CFT, we are able to read off the effective action of the matter fields that runs around in this uh, tensor uh, that is. Uh, uh, encoded in this tensor network. Uh, so you can also start computing three-point functions and it is not hard to convince yourself that you, you uh, the, the three-point functions would look like uh, Witten diagrams where you build off Green's functions that meet at certain vertex and the vertex would be basically given by the OP coefficients of the dual CFT. And so all the correlation functions uh, would be basically built up of Witten diagrams when we uh, inspect uh, compute it from the tensor network. And so it looks like the tensor network is encoding some effective theory in the in this discrete space and that uh, the relationship between this effective theory and the boundary CFT obeys uh, the usual ADS CFT uh, is related by the usual ADS CFT dictionary. The, the ADS CFT dictionary emerges in this tensor network. Okay, so, so that is something that we have known for uh, two years now, two, two, three years now. And, uh, and, and you can see that we're doing things that is very close to the pure ADS background. Uh, and so, uh, so now the next task uh, uh, in the remaining 20 minutes is to generalize it uh, to, to curve, uh, to, to deform this geometry away from this pure ADS space. Uh, in Sorry, fact, uh, back Yes. Sorry, before we move on, I have a question on this two-point function. Right. Right, if you go one slice right here, like, well, because in the second slice you wrote the Grimm function is P to the, uh, like, minus delta times D something, right? Yes. This geodetic distance will, will it be dependent on the periodic number you're choosing? Ah, okay. So here, so, uh, I have so what so you can see that these two point functions I have x1 and x2 right two different points uh, in the QP line and then I pick up uh, this uh, distance so here I'm uh, treating every leg to have the same uh, 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 to, uh, treating every leg to have the same distance so I just need to count the number of legs here and I get a number it's divergence because the tree is infinite so I do have to uh, do some uh, not uh, uh, on regularization. But that aside, this distance, this geodesic distance between uh, two points, 
uh, uh, that, that connects two boundary points is proportional uh, to this object here, x min x1 minus x2 to the power minus 2 delta. A p to the minus delta, uh, delta d is proportional to x1 minus x2 to, uh, to the power minus 2 delta. And this is a real number. Okay, so let me uh, be, uh, let me emphasize that uh, x itself is a piadic number, but the piadic norm takes you from a piadic number to a real number. So this is a real number. P to the minus V is now a real number. X is a right. piadic number. Piadic That's norm. actually what I, I think, because your piadic norm depends on your piadic number P, right? Yes. So that means the distance, the geodesic distance somehow should also dependent, be dependent um, on your piadic number. Oh, brilliant. Yes, 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 yes. This is a very good question. Uh, this is one thing that makes uh, piadic uh, norms very interesting. It totally do not obey the notion of distance for the real numbers. And the notion of distance changes. Uh, the distance between two points changes as you change P. That's absolutely correct. That's all. That's a wonderful question. Okay. okay. But will that affect like um, the two point function? Uh, it would affect the uh, value for the two-point function, but it doesn't affect how things are computed. So I didn't say what happens if p is greater than 2, then this tree would have uh, more legs, right? But uh, remember, uh, so uh, also I, I didn't say that uh, from the, the crossing symmetry of this piadic CFT would have consist would be some consistency condition on the OP coefficients. But all it led to, because the... Um, Conformal blocks looks pretty trivial because you can't see the contributions of descendants. The conformal blocks looks pretty trivial. And so when you inspect the constraints that follows from uh, crossing symmetry, all you see is that uh, the OP coefficients have to be associative. So if you uh, so if you uh, uh, if the OP coefficient is associative, then this piadic tree for arbitrary P when I have more legs, I can just break up this uh, uh, p like a uh, fusion uh, uh, this p like vertex into fusion a fusion tree where every vertex is uh, only three three valent but i can build up this uh um uh, if i have more legs uh what i mean is that let's say if i have p uh equals uh a three then i have four legs i have to define a tensor for uh, that works for four legs but all i need to do is just to turn it around into this. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, and as long as uh, uh, fusion is associative, I can fuse these two first or fuse uh, things in different orders and they give the same result. Uh, and, and therefore, I would be able to uniquely define this vertex for P uh, greater than two. So this is something that I didn't talk about. It's uh, uh, but, but, but uh, it doesn't change the uh, gist uh, of this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, is yeah. there other questions? Yes, yeah, it's, it's really good. Thanks very much. It's very nice. Oh, thank you. Okay, so now let's move on to bending this tree. Ooh. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, we have uh, thought about bending this tree back in 2019 when we uh, first built up this tensor network. Uh, how did we uh, bend this tree? So the idea follows from what we do in usual ads -CFT. If I have some scalar fields and I want to turn on some uh, uh, renormalization group flow, then what do I do? I change the boundary conditions of the scalar fields uh, in the asymptotic boundary. Uh, if I change the uh, 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 boundary conditions, then the scalar fields would acquire some uh, expectation values in the bulk, and then it would back react on the geometry, and I would get the curved space time. So, uh, so, so we decided that uh, let's try to change the boundary conditions. For initially, we claim that. The boundaries are all projected to the identity label. Now let's project it to the identity plus something else. Uh, then you can, just by staring at this tree, then you realize that this tensor network, even though we haven't changed anything in the bulk, it definitely is describing some different geometry. 
uh, how do we see that? So recall that if I uh, put all the boundary conditions to be zero, then zero, zero fills to zero, zero, zero fills to zero. Now the boundary condition is zero plus, uh, so, so when everything fills to zero, then essentially every vertex and every leg contributes equally to the uh, correlation functions, to the partition function. And therefore, uh, it is describing a geometry that is completely homogeneous. Now, if I have zero plus j in the boundary, then zero plus j fusing with zero plus j becomes zero plus two j plus some other stuff. Uh, j, j and j fuse to some complicated stuff that I don't know uh, what it is depending on the theory. And uh, this, so this, uh, so this vector here uh, would be different from the boundary conditions that I put in. But now when I fuse this stuff with this stuff uh, here, then I get some more complicated stuff uh, as a fusion product. So you can see that the fusion is changing wrap, uh, layer by layer as I move down this tensor network by changing the boundary conditions. And so clearly this tensor network is describing some other geometry. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, so, so then it gives us the question, how do I assign distances when the geometry is clearly no longer homogeneous? Uh, and so this is something that uh, we did uh, with uh, our postdoc Lin and uh, our student uh, Shiro. Uh, so in, uh, in general, this seems to be, uh, if, if the boundary condition is completely uh, uh, arbitrary, uh, this seems to be a pretty difficult problem. And so we wanted to, uh, as for simplicity, uh, we tried to work with uh, a, a, a perturbative limit where this j is not too far away from zero. And therefore, we can set up a perturbation theory around a, a small j. Uh, initially, uh, when we considered this problem, uh, when I first uh, talked about this uh, two, uh, one, one, one year ago, uh, we considered homogeneous boundary condition that would correspond to some homogeneous RG flow. Uh, but then when we try to obtain uh, an Einstein equation, we later realized that it is better, it's actually more powerful if we consider inhomogeneous boundary conditions where all these J's are small, but they could be different at different points in the boundary. So this is what we're going to consider. So we have to, uh, the, our task is split into uh, three parts. Uh, remember, we have to assign distance to dif two different points. We have to find out a way to compute the stress tensor of this theory uh, uh, encoded in this tensor network. And then finally, we have to compute the curvature and compare the stress tensor with the curvature. So task number one, compute stress tensor. So uh, in order to compute stress tensor, I have to tell you how to compute the expectation value of the scalar fields. Uh, and so, so in order to do that, then I have to, uh, this, uh, I have to prop, uh, give away how to compute expectation, uh, how to insert an operator of the bulk scalar field. Our proposal is that, uh, remember every vertex is a fusion, it's, it's just a fusion of uh, this, uh, uh, primary labels. So if I want to insert a scalar field that is uh, dual to a particular primary label, let's uh, propose that uh, this is equivalent to inserting an extra leg that it's fused with the rest of uh, uh, the, the, the labels uh, on this vertex. So why is this a sensible thing to do? Imagine the boundary is all identity. Uh, then I could see that uh, everything is identity and then I fuse it with something that is A. Uh, so this leg would be A, but everywhere else is identity. So there's nowhere else this A could be absorbed. And so the expectation value is necessarily zero. Uh, what if I uh, uh, now I have this non-trivial boundary conditions, uh, zero plus j, zero, zero plus j, zero plus j everywhere, then I can see that if, uh, let's say if I work in the perturbative limit, uh, and so what, it, what is the linear contribution uh, from, from, from these uh, boundary conditions? Uh, I could see that if I insert an a here, then I uh, this uh, a line could be absorbed by one of the boundary points to linear order in J. Uh, 
And so I would collect a Green's function that connect a boundary point to this uh, bulk point, but then I have to sum over the contribution of all the boundary points. So I would essentially have a Green's function connecting from a boundary point to this bulk point, and then I have to integrate or sum over all the contributions of these boundary points. And so this looks like exactly what we know in usual ADS-CFT. If I have non-trivial uh, boundary conditions and I want to compute the expectation value of a bulk or scalar operator, then I would basically have this bulk boundary uh, propagator that connects a boundary point to this bulk point, and then I integrate over all the boundary points. Now I can also compute to quadratic order uh, the expectation value, then I would basically look at two different points in the boundary, uh, and then I collect their Green's function that uh, uh, connects to a, a vertex uh, that ultimately connects to uh, this boundary point. So I would get three Green's function uh, at quadratic order, and I have to sum over all the contributions of these pairs of J uh, from the boundary. So you can see that the systematic of computing expectation value for this phase uh, look exactly the same as usual ADS-CFT in the perturbative limit. So uh, we have given uh, a way of defining expectation values. Okay, so then we have uh, 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 we have completed this task, but it's not the end of the story, because in order to obtain a stress tensor, I have to say uh, how do I how does this uh, bulk matter couple to metric when the metric is deformed away from pure ADS or pure Brutthaus history. And so I have to come. Uh, so even though I know that when uh, the boundary is mostly zero, uh, this Green's function, uh, the effective action looks like a kinetic term with mass term with some uh, 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 interaction term that has some coupling. This is a, a, an effective action that is good for pure ADS space. If I want to work with uh, perturbation away from pure ADS space, I have to decide how this stuff couples to the background metric in order to compute, uh, uh, ex expect, uh, in order to find uh, the expectation value for the stress tensor. So I have to do some covariantization here. I don't, ex uh, so, uh, and, and then I haven't described how to assign distances to the edges. And then after assigning distances to the edges, I have to decide how to uh, construct uh, an Einstein Hubert action for this graph. Uh, so how do I do that? We made lots of guesses and the results uh, all, the, uh, the results all look pretty poor. And so my postdoc, uh, he made a brilliant suggestion and then he says, let's stop making uh, wild guesses. Let's try to be systematic. We are working with a perturbative limit. And if we don't know how to covariantize the action, we don't know how to write down distance, then let's try to write down what we don't know. So what do we mean by that? So what he meant is the following. So uh, if the, uh, we, we're working in a perturbative limit and we want to assign distance to two points. So, uh, so let's look at a graph. And so let's say I want to assign distance between these two points. What exactly are the data that is relevant to this edge? So remember, our first intuition is that uh, uh, the boundary stuff, they fuse and then uh, they get, you, you get some new vector that is uh, after fusion. And then you fuse again and you get, get some other uh, vector here. So every edge has two different ends. So every edge here has one end connected to the boundary and the other edge is also connected to the boundary uh, uh, through the other, the rest of the tree. So the, uh, the, the uh, the data on the tensor network that is relevant to this edge appears to be the uh, results of the fusion when I move from the boundary, fuse everything, and then reach this end of the edge, and also fuse everything uh, from the rest of the tree to reach this end of the uh, the edge. So it looks like the edge, the only uh, data that is relevant to this edge is basically this two piece of information that uh, came from fusing, uh, contracting all the indices from uh, the, the tensors. And so let's say, uh, uh, so let this V here corresponds to uh, fusing everything, uh, reaching the, uh, getting a vector on this end, and V tilde corresponds to the vector that came from uh, fusing everything else and reaching the other end of, of this edge. And since we're in the perturbative limit, uh, if I, uh, everything, uh, so I would have the identity, and then plus 
uh, uh, some linear terms in J and some quadratic terms in J. And similarly for this V2, I would start with the identity and then I have some uh, linear terms. So this lambda is some linear terms in J. Lambda 2 is some quadratic contributions in J. It would be very complicated, but uh, uh, I have some, this power series expansion. So the idea is that, okay, if I want to assign distances to J, I know that when all of the boundary conditions are all identity, then uh, the distances must be all equal to 1. Uh, they're all the same. I can all normalize it to 1. Now, if there's some all these boundary conditions, uh, then the distance would be deformed from 1. And, uh, and that there should also be a power series expansion in this boundary data. So, uh, so let's say the deformation away from one, I call that J, uh, there would be some linear terms in this uh, boundary data. There would be quadratic terms in the boundary data and cubic terms and so on. Uh, so uh, since the distance should be complete, should, should not be, uh, should not distinguish the two endpoints. Therefore, I would require that this expansion is symmetric between the data from the two ends. And so uh, this is the only requirements that I have on this uh, expansion coefficients. But otherwise, I don't know what these coefficients are. And uh, if I don't know what they are, I'll just leave them as unknown. And similar, we do similar things to the curvature that is built up from uh, these distances. Once we have a, an expression for this distance, we can ask, can we build up a, an Einstein-Hilbert term that depends on this distance? We know that when there is no per boundary perturbation, then all the distance is equal to 1. And the curvature should also have a, a, a regular expansion in terms of this deformation away from 1. So we start with a constant and then linear in deformation uh, and then quadratic in J uh, and, and so on. So uh, what do I mean by Rx here? So let me, Rx, I mean uh, a point X uh, and I want to look at the curvature that is around this patch X. So uh, at X, there would be certain number of legs connected to this uh, X and the curvature should be a function of all of these edges. And so he, what we're writing down here uh, what what what, what uh, oh dear uh, uh, what we're writing down here is that this jx are all the uh, uh, edge edges uh, this edge distance that are connected to the point x and so if I want to compute the curvature of, of the patch around x then I need to know all the distance of the edges connected to x and I have an expansion and the coefficients here only require that it is completely symmetric in all the edges and I should have no other constraints uh, moreover this a0 a1 and b they shouldn't know anything about the uh, conformal dimensions or OP coefficients of the uh, of the that that follows from the tensor network because this is some universal uh, uh, geometric expansion of curvature on distances. So these things should not depend on the tensor network itself. It's just a geometric thing. But this J here, this A A B B or B A B and stuff, they could depend on the tensor data. They, they could depend on conformal dimensions, uh, but, but this A0, A1, they shouldn't depend on them. Now, I should do the same thing to uh, uh, covariantizing the uh, matter action. I know that when, there's the, when the boundary conditions are all identity, then I have a kinetic term, I have a mass term, and I have some interaction terms. And, but uh, when I deform the boundary, I have to couple these things. I have to covariantize them and couple them to edge distance. I don't exactly know how to do that, except that, okay, the mass term, I should have some volume form. And for the uh, kinetic term, I should have the volume form, but I also should have some G inverse. And I don't exactly know precisely what it is. So let's say it depends on the edge uh, uh, connecting X and Y to some power K. But I don't exactly know what K is, uh, and, uh, and, but here I just have the volume form uh, that is coupled to the mass term. Uh, similarly, for the uh, couplings, uh, for the interaction term, uh, I would also put in a function of uh, D, uh, 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 of the edge distances. Uh, and uh, what is this function of D? I don't exactly know. I only know that when all the Ds are equals to 1, then it should reduce to the effective action that we already know that reproduce the correlation functions uh, that is destroyed by this tensor network. And so all of this HD uh, would also uh, can also be expanded in this uh, power series of J. 
And so that's what we get. We get a power series uh, of uh, we get an action that is a power series of uh, dependence on J. And J, in turn, is a power series that depends on. Sorry. Uh, so uh, 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 the covariant action is a power series that depends on uh, J. But then J, in turn, is a power series that depends on this boundary. Uh, conditions omega. Uh, so now I can derive. Uh, so I have a. Uh, I can derive the uh, equations, uh, effective equations of motion from this guessed action. Uh, so I have a guessed uh, uh, Einstein-Hilbert action. I differentiate with respect to uh, J, and I get some stuff uh, that is a power series in J. Uh, then I have the covariantized action. I differentiate with respect to J, and I. Then I get uh, this uh, uh, effective stress energy tensor uh, uh, that depends. Uh, that is a power series in phi and also in uh, uh, in in J. I expand it up to linear order in J, and so this is what you get. And I have lots of undetermined coefficients. Uh, that is the uh, couplings uh, that, that 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 remains, uh, and this k that is undetermined. And so now the question is, and this phi in turn can be replaced in, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, of the omegas. Uh, this uh, so so remember this phi are computed in terms of these uh, uh, in terms of this boundary data. So we have already assigned a way of computing this uh, 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 expectation value of phi, and so. Uh, at the end of the day, what we have is uh, we have a stress tensor that depends on phi, and phi can be replaced by all this uh, tensor network data. We have a, an Einstein-Hilbert action that depends on J, and J can be written down in terms of the tensor network data uh, with lots of unknown coefficients. Now we ask the following question. Is there any possibility that G plus T is equals to zero? Is there any choice of these unknown coefficients such that when they add up, it is equals to zero? Now remember, we have chosen boundary conditions that are completely arbitrary, and so these things, when you write down in terms of the boundary data, it looks like a mess. Uh, so you have a lot. Uh, you ha uh, so so you try to collect all the terms that depends differently on the boundary data, and you require that they are vanishing. Uh, all the coefficients of this uh, boundary data is vanishing term by term. And so there is lots of uh, equations because you have uh, arbitrary, completely arbitrary boundary data, and so these unknown coefficients, as much as we, uh, as as uh, even though there are many of these unknown coefficients, they are overdetermined by these uh, 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 by 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 requiring that g plus t is equals to zero. Uh, I'm a bit over time, but I can finish within two three minutes. So, so, the, so the point is, by requiring that, uh, the uh, so we, we substitute in all the boundary data, it looks like a mess. But when we compare them term by term, requiring that different uh, functional dependence uh, vanish term uh, separately, all the coefficients separate uh, vanish separately, we recover. Uh, lots of equations on these unknown coefficients that we put in, and it just turns out that there's a unique solution to all of these uh, unknown coefficients up to overall normalizations. In particular, in particular, there's a uh, 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 this uh, geometric the, the the curvature dependence on the distances uh, admits a very very simple uh, solution. It says this. B and C uh, has to take this ratio after imposing that the mass and the conformal dimension has this relation. This relation is known back uh, when we compute correlation functions. So this is something that we have to impose. But once we impose this, it tells us that this parameter k is equal to one, and this two b over c is equal to minus p. If you put these numbers back into the curvature, it tells you that in this perturbative limit, the curvature. Is equals to box j x y, and so it just happens that if you look at the mathematics literature uh, uh, with a summary in Gupsus, uh, 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 in Gupsus and Company's paper in 2017 or something, when they also try to consider uh, putting in uh, gravitational dynamics in the Brutthardt's tree, so they considered uh, how to define uh, Einstein-Hilbert action on the Brutthardt's tree. 
they uh, they use results in the mathematics literature. They find that uh, the Einstein-Hubert action is precisely given by uh, uh, the, the, some uh, graph Laplacian of the edge distance. And so what we find from the tensor network is that uh, this result just emerged by requiring that uh, the data that we uh, that is obtained from the tensor network, the distance uh, and the um, uh, stress tensor that is read off from the tensor network, if you require that they are related, then it says G has to take this simple form. Uh, so, so, so this is something that emerges uh, from, from the tensor network. And moreover, when uh, so we assign distances, and the distance is the power series in the boundary data. It looks very complicated. But when the dust settles, the distance actually takes a very simple form, which is in fact a Fisher information metric. So, what is this state? What is the uh, what is this state uh, where we take the Fisher information metric that recovers the distance on uh, this uh, tensor network? It turns out that uh, uh, ux, this state that we're talking about, corresponds to sticking an extra leg. Uh, so, so this tensor network has no dangling legs because all the boundaries have been projected to particular directions. But if I stick in an extra leg, then it is basically a wave function with exactly one leg. Now, if I want to compute the distance between two points, I stick one leg here, I define a state, and then I stick another leg here and define a second state. And when I compute the Fisher information distance, that is the distances that is required uh, uh, that that is the distance that we got by requiring that, that um, uh, the Einstein equation is in fact satisfied. So so this just uh, so by uh, by inspecting the solutions for all these unknown coefficients that we have solved, uh, that that defines this distance. So after solving for all of this A B and stuff, uh, we recognize that the answer that pops out. It's just a Fisher information metric uh, that is defined by these very simple uh, states. And so this uh, intuition that uh, distances comes from correlation, comes from some inf Fisher information uh, metric is indeed uh, realized uh, in this tensor network. So I'm already over time. Let me just uh, conclude. So uh, we have looked at uh, some particular way uh, to deform uh, this tensor network to describe some curved uh, geometry. Uh, and uh, by requiring, by asking the question uh, whether an Einstein equation exists, it just turns out that a unique Einstein equation up to normalization, at least in this perturbative limit, uh, emerges uh, out of this te uh, tensor network. And um, uh, and so currently we are trying to generalize uh, this story to more realistic CFT. But since I've run out of time, uh, I will not say anything further unless you ask me. Uh, so okay, uh, let me just stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's true a bit over time, so we have uh, time for a couple questions. Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I won't claim to have understood uh, much of what you talked about for the simple reason that I don't have a very good intuition about p addict number. I see. Uh, so, uh, so I lost, I lost something, I guess, that is that, you know, I, I can ask, which is that ultimately our goal is to like make contact with the real world. Right. And, yes, and 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 the world as we like generally describe it, uh, from I mean, it is not p-adic, right? I mean, maybe maybe at some, some level, quantum gravity might have a description in terms of p-adic numbers. Uh, uh, so, so you you know what the question is? Like, I mean, how do you see this like ma matching up, or you know, how the correspondence between your construction uh, and something that is based on the real numbers, let's say, or or, or usual ADS geometry. I see. Uh, the con the correspondence is uh, somewhat uh, 
wider. So why did uh, Gupta and friends looked into uh, the pietic uh, ADS-CFT in the first place? That was because um, I think uh, the, the, the direct motivation is that um, uh, the pietic numbers are related to the real number uh, through this uh, relation, so-called uh, the adelic relation. And uh, what that is, is that uh, if you take the norm of a pietic number, uh, so let's say you take the norm of any rational number, or the pietic norm of any rational number, let's say the two-adic norm of two, and then you multiply uh, the uh, norms of this rational number, uh, the two-adic norm, the three-adic norm, the five-adic norm, all the way to infinity. And the result is equals to the real uh, one over the real norm. So the product of all of this stuff is somehow equal to the real norms. Uh, so uh, the uh, so so I cannot claim that I know immediately how to start from this tensor network and recover something uh, that is continuous. But uh, there are some very amazing uh, uh, results that were obtained by Gupser and his students uh, uh, later. Uh, so for example, they computed conformal blocks uh, of this pietic stuff. And then they just realized making use of this adelic relation, they're able to reproduce uh, uh, or identify new identities of co uh, conformal blocks in, in, in real CFT. So the relationship between this pietic stuff and the real stuff is a bit, is not that straightforward. And I cannot claim that I know how to get uh, a very precise relation, but they are very intimately related. It looks like this thing is, it looks very discreet, but uh, but somehow when you take all of the piece together, you can learn something about the continuous case. Right. So there it probably are. is not very helpful because I, I don't know how to do that uh, at present. No, I mean, you must obviously have some sort of intuition. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't pursue this. Uh, so I'll have uh, to look at good search papers. Um, I, it's not that. Uh, so to be fair, we uh, in, in this construction, I didn't really use anything that is particularly pietic what we have only what we have used is just the structure of this tree and also through the so without the pietic adscft i wouldn't be able to say anything about the effective action of matter right i i used the pietic cft so that when i compute i can say i'm computing correlation functions of the cft and then through computing uh, correlation functions of the cft I can uh, uh, match with what you do in the usual ADS-CFT case and say, look, uh, there's a mat of uh, effective theory that is hidden in this tensor network. So that, so piatic CFT is used only up to this, is only up to identifying an effective uh, action of some matter fields living in this bulk. And I haven't actually used any other uh, properties of pietic numbers uh, in this discussion. The rest you can see that is completely uh, uh, is is only based on this tensor network and nothing else. So you can think of it as uh, once you know how to identify matter fields in this tensor network and distance in this tensor network, then I can always ask whether there is some kind of uh, Einstein equation that relate this two set of data. But uh, so 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 ultimately, we're asking: Can we read off some effective theory uh, that is encoded by every tensor network? Is there some kind of local effective theory hidden in in, in a tensor network so that we can read off geometry and read off uh, the contributions of matter separately? But without inspirations from the pietic ADS-CFT, it's very difficult. This task is super difficult. Tadashi made uh, also made uh, many. Uh, had, they, they had many attempts uh, in this C mirror tensor network. They tried to read off distance. They defined some Fisher information metric, and they can see that oh, there's some kind of black hole geometry or ADS geometry that uh, could emerge. But uh, to 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 find a, 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 an Einstein equation that relates matter content and uh, geometry, it's it's very hard because it requires too many levels of guessing. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, in general, it's uh, it's very difficult. 
yeah, to read off. Can I just ask a question? Ah, uh, yes, please. Sorry, yeah, so thanks for this very nice talk. Well, actually, I have two naive questions. So one, is there, uh, is it clear how to do this construction for Lorentz in space, like, you know, for Lorentz in tensor networks in some sense, or? Oh, wonderful. Uh, I, so uh, the quick answer is, I don't know. But uh, on the other hand, uh, towards the end of my talk, I was talking about that uh, I'm, uh, I probably mentioned to you back in uh, uh, the last, when we, we met last time that I'm trying to do this for some more realistic uh, CFT. And it is possible to do it for some more realistic CFT. Whether you have a local bulk, uh, a local bulk theory is a different issue because C, the central charge is not that big, but it is possible to build up something that looks like ADS space. Uh, and uh, so, so what exactly is going on? So in this uh, periodic CFT, uh, I use I essentially use an associative algebra to define the bulk. The OP coefficients define an associative algebra, and uh, an associative algebra. If you uh, 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 if you look into uh, discussions of TQFT, uh, then you realize associative algebra is what you use to define two dimensional TQFT. And so essentially, I have something that is actually pretty classic. I have a two dimensional TQFT that recovers some one dimensional CFT. And so that inspired us to look into these topological models in two plus one dimensions. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then it just turns out that these people, they had a, some uh, very beautiful work that says, if you take the wave functions of some two plus one dimensional uh, topological models, and you put in appropriate boundary conditions, namely to take the, uh, some appropriate overlap with some direct product states, then you get CFT, uh, CFT partition functions. CFT partition functions uh, of known CFT, let's say Ising model, or uh, any of the integ uh, uh, integrable, uh, any of the, um, uh, I, I wanted to say integrable models with critical points, let's say uh, all the minimal models, you can actually get the exact uh, correlation of uh, their uh, partition functions by taking overlap of uh, the wave function of a a uh, two plus one dimensional theory with a direct product state. You can see that what we have done essentially is exactly that. We have some direct product states, and then we take this. Uh, uh, we have some wave functions that is uh, defining. Uh, uh, we have some one dimensional wave function of a two dimensional TQFT, and then when you take the overlap between this direct product state and this uh, wave function, you get a CFT partition function. And it just happens that in the real CFT case, you have exactly the same thing. You take a wave function of two plus one dimension, you, uh, and then you do an overlap with a direct product state, you get a CFT partition function. And actually, once you have this, I know how to do Lorentzian. Because um, these partition functions, they discovered them by matching it to known integral models. Uh, so the, they, the way they discovered these boundary conditions was that uh, they, they uh, uh, so, so I cited these people, but it actually was a long series of work that were uh, a series of observations made by condensed matter theorists uh, back uh, that, uh, that, that, that has a very pretty long history. But, that, but then the point is they made comparisons of this uh, correlator, this uh, overlap with known integrable models. And then they find that uh, they can match it exactly by picking these boundary conditions. And if you work with integrable models, you should know that uh, when you, you can analytically continue the uh, spectral parameter to turn it into a Lorentzian model. And so when I start looking into these uh, uh, tensor networks that describe uh, real CFT, then I sort of know how to do the Lorentzian version. In the Piatic case, I don't know how to, just because I don't even know what is the Lorentzian version of the Piatic CFT itself. But, but, but for real CFT, then I actually sort of know how to do that. So, 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 uh, so, so in, in this case, uh, 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 these, these are topological wave functions, and you can do coarse graining of them, and they are exactly invariant on the coarse graining. 
So here, what I'm saying is that you start with some overlap, and then you start to coarse grain this wave function. Turn the uh, so you can start from this lattice and then turn into this lattice that is much bigger. Uh, and so 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 this lattice, the wave function of this lattice and this lattice is related by some linear maps. And uh, so as I continue to coarse grain then I would be generating these linear maps. With, uh, I would have many, many layers of these linear maps, and they would start to look like uh, ADS space. So, 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 uh, and so it is similar to this tree. Uh, this, this tree is basically a coarse graining of some wave function uh, that in the radio direction. It's topological, and, and you do coarse graining in the radio direction, but then you take overlap with some direct product states. It becomes, oh, uh, a safety position function that takes the form of a uh, uh, ADS that has the form of an ADS space, and so we were generating this three-dimensional object, uh, 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 something that looks like ADS three, by starting with this um, topological wave function and then cross grain it and then generate a three-dimensional object. But in this computation, a lot of the things are done numerically. I don't know. So in this case, I don't know how to do uh, things analytically but uh, it is possible to compute things like bulk boundary propagator um, numerically uh, on this three-dimensional object and you can get an approximation of the ads bulk boundary propagator so 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 this is uh, so so this is something that we're currently writing uh, but 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 when, when but i hope that ultimately there will be some better ways to do things because once we start doing numerics, a lot of the things are not very well controlled. Okay, thanks. Chai, in view of time, um, I think it's good if we stop here. Um, let me thank our speaker again. Sorry. Um,